Hey everybody, Andy here, happy Thursday. Welcome back to Live Office Hours. Got a great one today on how to change your thoughts. Hope, hopefully you're here with me live, but if you're watching on the recording, welcome. Great to be back after a week off. Good to see everybody. Hope you're as charged up about this as I am. So I got a, a, a pretty good talk. I wanna say this is more of a conversation I'd like to have with you. There are a lot of teaching points. I do have some note cards, but I, I wanna, uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about attitude lately. How do I keep my spirits up? Uh, how do I you know, remain confident? Nobody loves me, all that good stuff. So I wanted, to, I wanted to talk with you about how to take and get command of your thoughts. And there's, there's really two main, two main issues here. There's the thoughts we have about ourselves are, am I confident that I can? I feel like an imposter, the self-talk. And then there's the thoughts that we have as we interact with other people. And I, I, wanna, I wanna actually address both of them today. And also my promise to you is I'm gonna give you the formula that I use to actually uh, control the way that I think, recondition and retrain my thoughts. And one of the things that you know I wanna, I wanna get right out in the beginning is there's some perspective that, I, this may sound obvious, but I, I, I'll feel better saying it, and I wanna make sure that I use it as a lead into to where this talk is going. You know, the, the, your entire existence, you have never had an experience that you were not at the absolute center of. And everything in your life happens in front of you, behind you, to the left and, and to the right of you. Your thoughts are immediate, they're urgent and they're real and and they're automatic and they're automatic based on how you have formed them over life uh, over your lifetime by the habits that you've formed the belief template that you have the way you've been conditioned the environment you're in the, your parents your friends your coworkers, and so on but my thoughts and everybody else's thoughts what need to be communicated to you and i think a big part of uh, being able to take control of our thoughts is recognizing what we are being automatic about, that, that self-talk or the judgments or whatever it might be, but that we are so automatic in what we do. And so today's talk is about how do we intercept that from being automatic. Yes, automatic is a good thing if it's the things we want to be automatic about. But, but I, I have a feeling that a lot of us want to change what we are automatic about and recondition ourselves. Now, I can't tell you what those are to be automatic about, that's up to you. But I'm gonna show you how I go about training myself and making sure that I am not automatic when I don't wanna be automatic. It's really, really important. So, and one other thing, one other thing I, wanna, I wanna mention is that uh, and while this may sound odd, but this is going to be, you know, something that 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 repeats throughout the talk is that we you don't actually change the way you think by trying to think differently. You change the way you think by doing differently. You have to do your way into a different mindset. You have to do your way into having different automated thoughts. You know, if you've ever heard anybody say to you, "Well, you just need to think about it differently." That's probably some of the dumbest advice you can get. You, you can't just think differently. You're not, you have not wired yourself that way. And we're not talking about thoughts that, that were hardwired at birth. We're, we're talking about thoughts that you've wired because of your conditioning. That is not something that you can just stop. You have to develop a habit that trains you to think differently, that trains you to recognize when you are being automatic. So I just, I want you to, I, I want you to, 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 to know that that's, that's really what this is about. And, and with thinking differently, I'm not talking about, I want you to step back and solve a business problem by thinking differently. That is something that you can do if you, if you come at it from different angles. I'm talking about the thoughts that we have as we walk around every single day and they're automatic and this is the way we process the world the way we think. I'm talking about those, okay? so. Uh, so you decide what you, you know, what you want to, what you want to do. But remember this, this point number one, if you want to change anything, you want to have lasting, we'll call it permanent for 
purposes of simplicity. But lasting change in the way that you think and what is automatic about the, your thoughts, that change occurs externally. It does not occur internally. You do not get rid of imposter syndrome by thinking your way out of it. It's simply impossible. Okay, now it may it may be a band-aid, but you're never going to have lasting change and confidence and belief in yourself. It's external. It's extrinsic. Okay? So, I want to I want to talk about what are the kind of the types of external things I'm talking about. Now there's two common types. Okay, one of them I'm I'm including uh, for uh, you know completeness sake, we're not going to have a, a, a ton of a, a time on this one. There are negative external things that happen to us that reshape our perspectives, and there are there is the doing and forming of a different habit in the way in which we will externally change the way we think. So when I say you you don't think your way into new thoughts, you do your way into new thoughts, that's what I'm talking about here. But let's take the first one very quickly just so you understand what I mean. When we, as our automatic, right, we take things for granted. We form these automated ways that we process the world and then something catastrophic happens. It could be really extreme, like a car crash. Somebody passes away. Somebody loses a limb. Very, very different. It could be something that you think is monumental, like you didn't get the promotion you were hoping for or the salary increase wasn't real, as big as you thought. These are, right, these are negative uh, activities that happen extrinsically extrinsically that make us change the way we think, that alter our attitude, right? That's what I'm talking about here. But for today's talk, I'm not really talking about those. I want to talk about the stuff where you have to do your way into a new form of thinking, a new uh, and have a habitual way to go about reshaping the way that you think. Okay? So 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 we're going to be we're going to be talking about about these two about these two things. Now, one of the things that I want to say about about the negative stuff is your perspective is a big part of, of how you think and what you think about. But perspective is a perishable skill, right? It, it happens immediately when something this negative or something extrinsic happens that we don't like or that harms us in some way. But it's much, much more difficult to have perspective about something that is continually good in your life and the level of appreciation that you have and the thoughts that you have about it, right? Perspective is a perishable skill. And if you don't do it often, daily, multiple times, and continually feed yourself those thoughts, your ability to have maintain that perspective is going gonna, is gonna to atrophy. So I want you to recognize that. But it's like that in anything. Even the things that you've become good at, the thoughts that you have that are positive, still need to be reconditioned. Okay? So but I, 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 want, I want you to keep this in mind. And we're going to talk, about the, we're going to talk about, about the doing. Now, two of, two of the ways that I think are the most prized thoughts that I want to talk about where I think if you understand how you can reshape the way you think about these two things, one is related to our relationships and interactions with others of any kind. It could be a short-lived relationship, a very long-lived relationship, or whatever it is. And then the other one is the confidence in which we have in ourselves. So this is about other people. This is about ourselves. If you can, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through these with you today because I think if you can get a perspective of what these things are, you will be able to apply them to other things that are similar in your life that relate to these. But I'll tell you what, you get these two down and you'll really be able to control the way you think about things, just about anything in your life. So, so these two are the ones that I think are going to give you the biggest ROI uh, for, for, for this discussion. All right. So before we get into, into the formula, I think it's a, good, um, it's a good idea to use a couple of examples and then let's reverse engineer the formula together. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples really quickly. So the first one is, let's take, let's take A because I think the interactions with others is a little easier to illustrate. So imagine you want to have a better interaction with, with somebody. And empathy is a prized, prized uh, thought. It is a feeling, right, to be able to identify with the feelings of somebody else. That compassion that you have or that understanding that you have or that connection that you have or that perspective or appreciation, whatever that may be. 
let's just say, sake of argument, you want to have a better discussion with your spouse, you want to have a better discussion with, with, uh, with your coworker, your customer, your client, whoever, whoever it might be. But let's say you're the customer service agent, that's your job. And if you are serving somebody else, uh, whether you're picking up the phone and, and you're helping them with their issue or you're answering their email and you're helping them with your issue, the one thing that you can be fairly certain about from a thoughts perspective in, in recognizing what's coming at you is that whoever is contacting you is contacting you because something is wrong in their life. Something is wrong with your product. Something is wrong with your service. They have a question. They're not calling the helpline because they want to tell you what a great job you're doing. Now, what most people do is, you know, they're their thoughts are automatic. If they're having a bad day, their thoughts are automatic. If they're having a bad week or a bad life, their thoughts are automatic. So in order to be empathetic or, or, or maintain that level of, of, uh, of interpretation of what it is that you're about to discuss with them or help them with, there's something that you need to do that I think sets you in the right frame of mind so that when you do actually feel the call, you're going to be in the right frame of mind to be empathetic and to be effective in handling that. And, and the one thing that that customer service agent can do is take a pause. It could be seconds. It could be minutes. But before they pick up that phone or before they answer that email, recognize this person has a problem. I don't know if I'm the first person that this person is talking to. I don't know if I'm the 10th person. I don't know how long this person's been waiting on our silly IVR and how frustrated they might be. I don't know how many times they've called, right? This, this is something that's a prelude that sets your mind in the right place so that when you pick that phone up or you answer that email, when you come at it recognizing or reminding yourself that, you, that this is a possibility and not only a possibility but a probability in this case, you're going to be in a much better frame of mind to then practice it in the doing, in the handling of the interaction, whatever that interaction might be, whether it's a phone call or a response via email. And then once it's done, taking a moment to look back and did I was I actually empathetic? Did I actually effectively answer the question, the call, the issue, resolve it, or whatever it might be? Here's another one that 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 is is along the same lines. But and I've mentioned this a few times to you guys before, right? Right now, 11, 12 on a Thursday, I'm your customer service agent, right? I get to come and I have the privilege of sharing my time with you and, and teaching you and helping you. And before every single show, just like that customer service agent, I sit in that, in that chair back there in that pretty gloomy room right now today because it's pouring rain. But, and I think about who would, who would show up on a Thursday, right? In the middle of the day, somebody's gonna spend some time with me chances are pretty high that they need help. They have some issues or they have some aspirations or maybe they just want to learn. But any which way, right, they're taking their time and attention. Now, I can't remember what it's like not to know what I know. They don't know what I know. If they knew what I knew, they wouldn't be sitting here listening to me kind of thing, right? So what might they be going through? They're probably going to ask me similar questions that they've asked me before, somebody else has asked me before, or I've created a video on it before. But somebody might have just found me five minutes ago, and they don't know that last week I put a video out, or five years ago I put a video out on that subject, or why would I think that they would watch all that stuff, or be able to digest it, and even if they found. So all these thoughts I, I use to remind myself so that when I sit here, and I'm about to teach you, or I'm about to answer your question, all of that stuff I've conditioned myself to remember it and for it to be in the forefront of my mind because it's going to shape the way that I'm going to, I'm going to respond to you. And then each time I go through the, the, the questions in the q and I reset that. And then what do I do? I try to be as effective, compassionate, empathetic to your situation when I give you my insight. And then what? When I'm done with this, I rewatch the show and I look at each every single minute, multiple times usually, to look at how was I? Did I, was I act, you know, you know what? That might not have been a question to be sassy. I probably should have been a bit more compassionate to that person who had a problem. I'll remind myself of that so that the next time that I come back to this, this is my 300th show. So you would think I would have this down, but every single time, think about people who operate at a very high level, anything. You see professional golfers using aids. You see them going through the same routine before they hit every shot, right? Everything is conditioned. It has a prelude, it has an execution, and then it has an evaluation, right? So if you think about it, now, 
I don't expect you to be blown away by my little formula here, but I want you to think about when I'm interacting with somebody, this can apply to any interaction that you have. The before, do you have a reminder and do you anticipate in a positive manner? I'm talking about anticipate what could happen. Yes, it might be negative, but I'm anticipating that when something like that happens, I'm going to remain positive in my response because that's what I can control. During it, during it, are you practicing it effectively? And then after, do you actually, do you actually reflect? Right, when you go into the meeting with the team, are you actually going to think about it for a few minutes, recognize that this one might talk too much, your boss might be having a bad day, all that stuff could be present. But are you taking the time to actually consider and think about what you're about to do? what they might be going through. How might your boss be feeling? Your boss might not be behaving well, but might he or she be feeling frustrated because their butt's on the line and they're relying on you to help them? That kind of stuff, right? But our own, right, immediate, urgent, real thoughts say, our boss is not being nice to me, right? So how do you change that? By taking the time to do these things over and over and over again. This really, this really, uh, this re it really matters. It, 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 it really matters that you, that you take the time. Now, I don't know how many of you, right? It, 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 that's pretty common sense, but it, is it always common practice? Do, do you actually do it? I mean, show of hands. Do, does, do any of you, as you walk throughout your day, I would like you to know, and people in my leadership program know this because I, I teach these principles, but as I go through each part of my day, I actually have to think about in each of my transitions of activities, even when I'm by myself, I go through that little formula very quickly to make sure that I'm dialed in, I know how I'm gonna handle this, I know what I'm gonna do, I know what I need to get done, I know how I wanna feel about it, and I know what success looks like. Okay, so when you're interacting with each other, that's something that you should do. Think about this, when my wife walks in the door at the end of the day, I don't know what kind of day she's had. So I say to myself, she could be happy, she could be sad, she maybe had a great day, maybe she had a rough day, she had a rough day, how am I gonna, how am I gonna react to that? The, it's not automatic, right? I had a long day too. So anything in your life, when you interact with, with others, it is about being able to intercept and become mindful of what it is you are about to engage with. That's the only way that you will ultimately have lasting change when you think about interacting with others. All right, so, so that's, that's about what I do whenever I'm going into some kind of interaction, but what about ourselves? What about the self-talk that we have? Well, from a confidence, from a confidence standpoint, I have put out a, a number of videos on how to build your confidence, how to overcome your fears, and there's different kinds of fears, but it's all the same. If we're not confident, we're fearful of something, there are things that we do over and over again where we wanna become better at it. Sometimes there's big projects that we have that we're afraid of and we don't have confidence in. Maybe we wanna write a book, maybe we wanna build a business, maybe we're working toward that promotion, maybe there's a, there's, we just feel like there's a lot of things. Well, the one thing that I wanna tell you about in your own individual self-talk is your ability to accomplish something has a lot more to do with where your focus is than where your ability is at any moment in time. This is so true, and I'm gonna get really specific, but your ability to accomplish something has more to do with where your focus is as opposed to where your ability level is or how proficient you are. Okay, so, so what, do I, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take let's take some let's take some scenarios here. I've got I've got three scenarios that I think would be good to talk around how we build confidence and overcome hurdles uh, that that we are not able to do something or not confident that we can do something or that it will turn out that or that it will turn out correctly. What's let's take the first let's take a big one. So let's say you got a big daunting project and you're not confident that you're going to be able to handle it. Like I said, maybe you want to write a book. There's about 18 or 19 things that go into actually writing a book and getting it published and getting it on a shelf somewhere. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that, even though people do it every day, right? But you've not done it, so you're not experienced and you're not sure what to do. 
Well, the one thing is, if your focus is on how difficult it's going to be in order to accomplish something, right, even though you haven't built all the skills to write a book proposal, to find a literary agent, to find a publisher, to actually write the outline, to write the book, and all those other things that you're going to have to do, if your focus is on all the things you need to do, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to feel that lack of confidence. If your focus is on, well, what's, what, what's the one thing that I got to do right now and how can I look at that as being successful? Where are the victories that I can find in what I need to do, the habits I need to form, the things, that, the steps I need to go through and whatever the project is or whatever the goal is where I can have victories over and over? I'm not talking about hollow victories. I'm talking about real victories here. Okay, well, what's one? Well, I got I to gotta get up in the morning earlier than normal. I got to get to my desk, which needs to be ready for me to write. I need to write a thousand, two thousand words a day, each day, day in, day out. I don't need to be Hemingway every day, but that in and of itself, and if your focus is on what you need to do and what you need to accomplish, and you look at that as the right success metric for that day, you're not going to get the book published that day, right? You're not going to be all ready to go. But how do I feed myself continually feeding myself those victories, forming that habit of the doing that's reconditioning the way that I think about who I am? Everything that we do is a function of who we think we are that feeds our self-image. And the only way to change that self-image is to form habits that reshape the way we think about what we are able to do. So we have to form a new habit. We form a new habit by continually doing each day, by raising our willpower to get up out of bed early, get to the desk, write the thousand words. And before we know it, after five days, there's 5,000 words. You're about one-tenth of the way to a 50,000 word book, which is that thick, right, kind of thing. And so if your focus is on what you're doing, if your focus is on the victory and you have the right success metric, and that's another thing that I wanna, I wanna continually say to you is that the success metric at the moment is not getting the book published. That's the intent and that's the long-term goal, whatever it is for you. But, but when I said where your focus is versus where your ability is, another way for me to say that is, are you actually focusing in on the right success metric at any moment in time? In this example, it's, did I write the thousand words? That's it, that's the goal. That's what tells you if you did it, even if it wasn't great writing, you accomplished the goal. That's success, check. Right, And you do that again tomorrow and the next day and so on. And yes, maybe you spend some time reading up on how to find a literary agent or what the book proposal needs to look like or maybe you go take some training on how to put a book proposal together. But whatever it is, right? So you got to break it down and make sure along the way that you're reconditioning yourself to have the right success metric. Too often we have incorrect success metrics. Let me tell you a story about that using our next example, which is, what if we're new at something? Andy, I'm not really sure how to do that. Well, I was new at something. Every single thing I've done, I've been new at, at one point or another, so have you. Okay, so back, you know, a number of years ago, I wanted to, I wanted to become a trainer in this capacity, and I was an executive recruiter at the time. Well, I spent uh, some time figuring out that if I wanted to create a product that was something I needed to learn, an online training program, and offer it to individuals, a business to consumer arrangement, that's a selling process, that's a marketing process, there's a community building process, and all of these things that I needed to do, I ultimately, if I was going to, to reach my goal of becoming a trainer and operating a business, I had to go through a number of steps. Now, ultimately, I wanted to sell a training program, which I did in 2016, which was the first program that I ever, I ever created and I ever sold. But I had never sold directly to a consumer before. I'd never email marketed before. I'd never done a lot of these things that were required in order to do this. So you've got, if you are new at something, you have to draw on a number of things that you've done in your past to give yourself some confidence. Let me give you an example. So when I was a recruiter and I would talk to individuals on the phone and I would try to recruit them, then I would hear, I would hear phrases that repeated. Things like, wow, those are really good interviewing techniques. I never really thought about that. I never heard of those techniques before. That's great. I would hear things like, wow, you're, you're really spending a lot of time with me to understand my needs. That's 
Really nice of you. No recruiters ever spend this kind of time to get to get to understand me. I really appreciate that, right? I'm I'm being careful, I'm being thoughtful, and all that good stuff. So I started leaning on that that when I ultimately was going to to sell that product, if the goal was I need to a hundred people to buy it, I'm not going to be very successful. I might throw in the towel, I might it might break my confidence. But if my success metric is wow, you've never done this before. The victory is in actually running the promotion. The victory is in some person bought it. Actually, 50 people bought it. Wow, that's amazing, right? I learned a lot. I collected a lot of data. I saw what people were interested. Now I get a chance to service these 50 people instead of 5,000 people, which actually would have been a problem for me, and so on. So what are the success metrics? If you know what these are in advance and you're focused on these, it's going to be a a lot easier for you to be to be successful and for you to be confident. This is a way that if, if you are doing something for the very first time, you've got to make sure. I'm not saying set the bar low. I My goal was to run a very successful business for many, many years, except that in the moment where my focus was, was more on what I was doing and the success metrics that I had set at that moment. Not what my ability was. I didn't have a lot of experience or abilities at that time in my life, right? I've grown those over time. So that's, that's one of the ways that you need to think about. If you are doing something new, there's two things you want to make sure of. You're drawing on whatever it is that you have. If you are a college student and you are coming out into the world and working at your first job, are you organized? You have your degree. You know how to study. You know how to learn new concepts. You know all of these things. List them out if you need to. And then what's your goal? Well, my goal is to reach out to employers. My goal is to do my best at interviewing. My goal is to get an interview. Those kinds of things, the right success metrics. Okay, what about, well, hang on. Something is going to go wrong. It's always going to go wrong. It always goes wrong. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. But would you let something that looked like a failure break your confidence? Well, it depends on how you look at it. If you've got the right success metrics, the failures don't look so bad. Let me tell you a funny story. So I did a triathlon this past weekend, and uh, it was something that I'd, I'd been training for for a long time. And over the summer, I was trying to sign up for a shorter triathlon so that I would get some experience, but I really couldn't, I, I really couldn't find some time in my schedule. I had a rough, rough go of it. So my coach says to me, well, um, yeah, I'm not really overly concerned, but I, I really think you need to get in the in the big lake with a lot of other people so that you recognize what it's like to swim around a lot of other people in an open body of water. I'd been training in lakes, I'd been training in the pool, but I was doing it by myself, and I'm either in the nice lane with the clear water or I'm in the lake by myself, basically. So I signed up for this long swim. And I signed up for my 1.2 mile distance, which is what I was going to be swimming in my triathlon. And I got to the I got to the beach this early Sunday morning, and I looked at the waves, and it was in Lake Michigan, and I didn't there was a big storm coming, and I I saw the waves were pretty high. I didn't really get nervous. I just figured it's water, and I'm going to be on top of it anyway, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. And then I went into the water, and I stood there about I don't know waist high, except if I just stood still, that water was going to splash me in the face. That's how high the white cap waves were. So I thought, okay, well, all right, I'm going to go get my wetsuit on and I'll get situated. And so I, I quickly got my wetsuit on very quickly and we, I got to the beach and then they were, as you they were sending us out in groups. So they sent me out into this um, squared area, about 30 meters out into the water where they would get you, all the people that were going to swim this 1.2 mile distance and they would put us out there and they would make us sit for a few minutes and then the horn would blow and then you would swim around in a diamond shape around this lake a couple of times. So as I'm waiting there and I'm, I'm you know, we're, we're treading water and we're going up and we're going down and we're going up and we're going down and I can see the people's faces turning blue and then the horn sounds and I started to swim. So I started to swim, right? Remember, it's the first time I'm ever doing this. So I'm swimming, I'm keeping pace with these people. This is pretty, you know, so far so good. It looks like I'm swimming at a pretty good pace and I swim a, a, a about 300 meters, and we're going up and we're going down, and I'm getting really nauseous, and I'm pretty good at motion sickness, except I was concerned I, <laughs> I was gonna faint. I mean, it was awful. 
So I reach my hand up. I call the nice boy over at, uh, who's sitting in the kayak. I said, hang on, I'll swim over to you. By the time I got over to him, somebody else already had the life raft, so I had to w tread water for 10 minutes to, for the rescue boat to come and get me. And then I got hoisted up on the rescue boat, and they dumped me up on the shore, and I had to walk about a half a mile back to the MC, who looked at me, and uh, he said, are you done already? Uh, yeah, I'm done. I didn't, I didn't go around that diamond twice. I basically got a few hundred meters out there and I needed to call no joy. So the guy brought me back and then the, the MC looked at me and he said, eh, don't feel too bad about it. We were delayed because we couldn't get the buoys to stay in the water because the waves were so rough. So no problem. Get back in my car. I drive home. I get back in bed. I text my coach and I said, I'm all done. She said, how'd it go? I said, I quit after 300 meters and I'm going to go check like the waiver form that I signed to, to, to see if this was like coaching negligence that you would let me get in this lake with this rough water at my skill level, right? So after I joked, the next morning I got up and I, I typed her a message in our little system that we use and I said, total success. I got down there. I got my wetsuit on really fast. I now know what a, what a water start looks like. My swimming speed is pretty good, it, relatively speaking, because I'm going to assume that, that I was the only idiot there who wanted to do this for the first time to swim that distance, and all the other people are experienced. I swam pretty quickly in a dead straight line. I only needed one wave of the hand to get the kid on the, on the kayak and one hoist to get up on the boat. I'm sure these are skills that I'm going to be able to tap into at some other point in my life. Seven victories, right? I was not going to let the intent of what I was supposed to do at any moment in time reduce all the victories that were in that one experience. And that's how I looked at it. And, and no, at the moment, I, I probably wasn't exactly as level-headed as I, I can say it to you now, but it didn't take long. What did that take? Conditioning, right? To go, I had a list of a number of things that needed to be accomplished on that morning. Then I did it. I didn't reach the ultimate goal, but I had a lot of victories, and that's what I focused on. So this is going to happen to you. So if you are ready and you go into your day, your hour, your event, knowing that this is what victory looks like, I'm anticipating what could happen, I'm going to do my best, and then I'm going to look for the victories. That's going to help reshape the way you think about yourself and what you can do. Now, don't get me wrong. Right? A lot of effort and a lot of habit forming went into being able to swim at all. Right? I swim six miles a week, week in, week out. So, so a lot of that was done. But on the day that I, I needed to publish the book, right, run the project, give the presentation, all this, it didn't go well. But that shouldn't shake your confidence. So as you think, as you think through these, I just I want to recap this with as you are interacting with others or you're thinking about something that you're doing for yourself, the best way to change your thoughts is to go through a very simple, very quick formula. Think and anticipate. Consider what you're about to do. Then as you're doing it, make sure that you're focusing on what you're doing and your success metrics were set properly. When you're done and you look back at what transpired, make sure you're focusing on the right success metrics. Having the wrong success metrics is what stresses us out. We're focused on the wrong thing. So believe me, a lot of your expectations, mis-expectations, um, will, will go away if this stuff is in order and then make sure that you're focusing on the right stuff. It has more to do with what you're concentrating on than, than, than your ability level at any moment. If you're not having the success you want, you're probably earlier in the process or you're early in the next level of the process. Right? We've accomplished this step already. I'm going to the next step. And even though I'm not a rookie, well, you're a rookie in here. Okay, so you have to be careful of that and just make sure, lastly, to cap it off, that your success metrics are dialed in properly. This perspective matters. It's what will stress you out if it's not dialed in correctly. Okay, and that's what I do. And that's why I'm able to, to kind of keep my, my thoughts in order. And, and like I said, if, if there's anything that you want to form a habit about in the way that you think, it's changed in the doing. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I knew I could get it in in under 35, and it uh, it looks like I was successful. So if you're here with me live, we're going to the Q&A. Uh, I got a quick couple of announcements. We're going to go right into the Q&A, and then if you're watching me on the recording, I'll see you next week. All right.
Uh, Kara, I just saw that and there was no way I could stop in the middle of what I was doing <laughs> do that, but I would be happy to, to, to talk about that. Hey, how about this cup? Okay, now you know this is my new favorite cup, right? Mm. Okay. Let me see. Where are we? Adam Stark. I got Adam Stark uh, first. Stacy is that. That about right? Okay. We got a few of these... Uh, Adam Stark, thank you for that. Yeah, the Iron Man was, uh, it was, it was, can you see the twinkle in my eye, man? Uh, we're going right on the next one. <laughs> it was good. Thanks for the good wishes. A lot of fun. All right, you got a question here. First LinkedIn, why are employee names hidden? Can't message them, making boss hunting hard. Also, if I can't find somebody to contact or their email, can I contact companies via customer inquiry email? Okay, couple things here. Now, when you say why are employee names hidden, can't message them. So there are variations in LinkedIn of why somebody's name would be hidden. The way you stated this, uh, I'm assuming you're going to the company page and trying to find employees. I would do an advanced search where I was selecting the company name and get the companies that work at there and, and they, their names should be exposed. Now, it also could do with the, maybe the level of, of LinkedIn, the premium level of LinkedIn you have or do not have. It also could be the way that somebody sets their individual uh, settings about who can see their name. So I'm not entirely sure about that. It could be any one of a number of things. But if you can't find somebody to contact or their email, I, I personally would not recommend going through a general company inquiry or customer inquiry email because whoever's going to field that is going to disregard it because it's not actually a customer inquiry. I would try as much as possible to, to, do, to do different things to either find them on LinkedIn or to find them some way in the corporate website or the corporate book or any publications or public documentation that's available. I just don't think that that will be very effective. And if that is in fact the case, I probably would just move on from the company or I would try to find somebody to boss hunt or a team member that I could at least try to connect with. All right, so I hope that I hope that helps there. And then I think there is another one related. Charlie Pace, how you doing? Started an AE job in January at a marketing agency. I've now been scheduled for a stay interview. Uh, I, I've now been scheduled for a stay interview. Is there a strategy for this type of interview? Should I start to plant seeds for advancement? Okay. Charlie, I'm actually not sure what you mean, meaning I don't know what a stay interview is. I'm assuming what you mean is you have to interview to keep that job or keep, um, you know, keep that job as an employee. But you said you started an AE job in January at a marketing agency. It's now October. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what that is, but if you are interviewing to keep your job, uh, I, I don't know that the strategy would be different than any of the other things that I've given you, but I would be leaning on the things that you've actually accomplished as opposed to the effort it's taking you to accomplish them. So uh, I don't, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, I'm fairly confused by your question. If you want to rephrase this and give me more specifics, I can, I can try to give you some more color. Uh, George, thank you. Luke uh, is, uh, let's see, Jeff Comstock, yes. Boy, Jeff, that rain was, uh, was pretty awful. You know, those results keep changing. I, I have not really looked uh, at, all the, at all the details, uh, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, George, Andrew had an offer just rescinded yesterday with no clear indication as to why. Any suggestions on how to handle this situation in the future? What to look out for? Okay, George. Uh, one thing to note, when an offer is rescinded, uh, number one, it is a not so common occurrence. So I don't like to uh, make random acts 
the norm. I don't, I don't like to try to have prescription for something that's very random like that. It's, to me, it's simple. You go to the employer, you say, what was the reason you rescinded the offer? Ask them. Now, you didn't give me any insight into, you know, were you counter offering? Were you delaying? Were you asking for more time? Were you whatever? So I don't know what the situation was. So it's difficult to say exactly how to handle it. But I, if it, you, you know, if you say, well, they rescinded it with no clear indication, I don't know what, what you did that could have caused them to do that. Regardless of what you did, it doesn't make any difference. I would ask them why. And I would not say that you need to look out for anything in the future because this rarely happens. And if it does, it's likely not a company you want to work for if, the, if they're that erratic. That's what I would say. That's what I would say to that. Hey, Aylin, how are you? Jared, you're welcome. I'm glad to do it. Patricia, ho hope you're doing well. And Ingrid, my boot campers, how are you? I'm working in Ingrid. I'm working in retail. Would love to work within an area I can fit in with my experience I have. Should I use the no job posting letter to apply or is there another approach? Okay. So Ingrid, a couple things, and let's be clear for everybody here. Ingrid's working in retail, and she would like to work in an area uh, she can fit in with her experience. So I'm assuming that she means I'm working retail as a, a, a part-time role, uh, and should I use a no-job position letter to apply? I personally would boss hunt, and, I, and remember, boss hunting is effective if you are targeting the right boss and you have the skills and experiences that that organization and his team or her team would need at that moment. Okay, that's the, you're looking for that intersection. So you could use the boss hunting technique with the no job opening twist. There's a template for you. And because you're in the boot camp, you're in my job search coaching program, there's a boss hunting Bible that, that takes you through exactly how to do everything, the templates, and then it gives you all your rebuttals to all their rebuttals. So all the templates are written for those, the eight, nine or 10 different things that they can come back with, and then what you should say in, in, in response to that. So I would, I would go into the boot camp in module two and, and grab the boss hunting Bible and use that and lean on that. That's a, that's a great question for sure. Mashid, how are you? Oh, good to see you. Huntington Row, what's up? Jim R., you guys are great. Julie, hey to you. Vanessa, Kara, Stephen Green, Melinda, great to see you from Nova Scotia. And Maureen, my boot camper, thank you for that. And Raul, my boot camper, thank you for that. You guys are great. Stacy, Carrie, Rafino, Rob Peterson. Yeah, it was a lot of fun talking, talking about this stuff today. All right, hey, couple quick announcements. I had to write these down because there's so many things. Uh, Stacy, can you pop up the Mile Walk Academy live calendar of events? So folks, just so you guys know what's going on for the rest of October, next Wednesday, I'm doing a special live office hours, so we're, we're not live on Thursday. We're live on Wednesday next week. And I'm gonna be talking about job search congruence across the way you think, how you market and your interview stories and consistency across this. Uh, I'm actually going to play a clip, uh, yeah, a decent sized clip, uh, from my job search boot camp. That's Wednesday. That's live. It's free. It's on the YouTube channel. On Thursday, I have a premium coaching program just with people, uh, members of my job search coaching program. I call them boot campers because it used to be called the job search boot camp, but they'll always be boot campers to me. Uh, that's Thursday. And if you are if you are in my leadership coaching program, we have a session on Friday, uh, the, the 15th, which is on Con, uh, prepping for and conducting your performance reviews. I wanted to make sure that my leaders had that information uh, from now so they can get everything ready because a lot of performance reviews are done at the end of the year. But this month, because uh, we're feeling a little generous to our boot campers, anybody who's in the job search curriculum, the job search coaching program, can stop by on Friday for that leadership premium 
uh, program. The replay is only available to the leadership members, but the boot campers can stop on by. And then the following week, another live office hours on Wednesday where we're going to be doing um, uh, some resume writing. I'm going to be showing you exactly how somebody looks at your resume, what they look for, what they're hoping to find, where they're hoping to find it, and all that good stuff. That's on Wednesday, the 2020th. And then the following week, Live Office Hours is on its regular time on the on Thursday. And then on fr- uh, 28th, on uh, uh, Friday the 29th, I have a private group coaching session with members of my resume writing workshop and 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 the boot campers again. So there's a lot going on. If you, uh, it's a great month to be a boot camper. You get a lot of extra coaching with the leadership program and with the with the resume writing session. We're going to be having toward the end of the month. Uh, we did put the boot camp on special for 100 off today through next Thursday. So we're running a little another little special for this month. If you want to to jump in, check out the page. Maybe Kara can drop that can drop that in, the, and she already did. I see. But uh, if you got any questions, support at milewalk.com. All right, let's roll. What do we got, Deb? How are you, my boot camper? P Bell, what's the good word? Is the market still wide open? I've got no's from a couple of second interviews. I do believe at this moment and for the foreseeable future that the market employment market that is will be kind to employees that doesn't mean that instantaneously some jobs going to pop up and you're going to grab it right away you know when some industry zig others zag but generally speaking the market is really good and there's a lot of job openings and and p bell uh, i would encourage you to uh take a look at uh, the, the live, uh, live, uh, actually, I, I think we, I think we might've clipped it out. Stacy, right? Do we, <laughs> do we clip out the section about where I did with the jolts report and all that stuff? Maybe P bell, maybe we need to give P bell that link to how I talked about what's happening in the employment market, what to do about it. Let's get, uh, P bell that, that, that video. Martin, Martin. Hey. Rachel Kim, thank you. Yeah, I uh, there's a lot of hours in the sun training for that triathlon for sure. Yeah, it was really, really, really good. It did feel fantastic. And do you know, I woke up the next day, I wasn't even sore, not one bit. We hopped in the car, <laughs> drove nine hours home. <laughs> oh, God. All right, Martin, when boss hunting? What would be the best approach to connect through LinkedIn and send resume without looking like a stalker since initially just initially is just messaging, not an email? Okay, so a couple of things here. This is a great question. And I think this also kind of loops back with what Adam kicked us off with. Uh, When you're boss hunting, it is best to try to identify the email address. It, it just is. Now, there's a couple of things. We, inside our job search coaching program in the, in the boot camp, as I refer to it, we teach you techniques where we, well, I think it's slanged LinkedIn x-ray, but it's really Google Boolean that helps unlock the LinkedIn database through Google Boolean strings that we basically show you what to do and what to write and what to put where so that you can do this so that you're searching outside of LinkedIn. It usually yields uh, a, a bigger list uh, with people's names. You can then, once you identify them and the organization that they're at, the one you were targeting, you can use a couple of other sites uh, called uh, hunter.io and verifyemailaddress.org to triangulate the email. They give you the email format. It's usually pretty, you know, over 90% accurate. And then I would send them a direct email. And I would try that route first. I would try always to get them a direct email where I was sending my resume. That does not look stalkerish. It looks like you are resourceful. And I give you a template, a couple of different boss hunting templates that are free to everybody that you can use. And then if you, now me, I don't believe in follow-ups, okay? I send it and that's that. And I move on with my life. And if that person gets back to me, great. And if not, then I don't care because I'm contacting a whole bunch of other people and I create more what we, what we call bid as balls in the air, 
right? If I message three or four people every day, if one of them, it gets lost or doesn't respond to me, I don't really care because I just messaged three others. And at the end of the week, I got 15 or 20. So that's the way I roll. I spend more time reaching out because I think your time is better spent. Now, stalkerish. If you want to, you're like, dang, I really want to try to connect with this person. You, you know, seven, 10 days later, if you want, send them another email or go through LinkedIn and just say, hey, I tried to email you directly, uh, you know, hoping I got your email address right, but I also thought I might use this platform to reach out to you to let you know, blah, blah, blah. And you can do that. That is not stalkerish. It really is not. Nothing bad's gonna happen to you. So that's the way that I would that I would go. You can do the opposite. You can send them a LinkedIn message if you'd prefer to go that route. I would attach my resume if you're boss hunting. I would put the, you know, kind of the text in the LinkedIn in mail. And then week 10 days later, try to direct email them. That's okay too. So so give that a try. But the one thing that I do want to kind of loop back with and for Martin and for Adam, if you're having trouble surfacing the name of the person, the Google Boolean that we show you how to write in the job search bootcamp, in the in the in the coaching program, that will resolve that issue for you. I didn't mention that earlier, but that that is something that that certainly would help unlock the names, unlock the email addresses. All right, so I hope Martin, I hope that I hope that helps. Thank you, Aylin. Uh, you know this. This is a. It looks really light blue on the screen, but it's really kind of a different blue. Randy Cole, what's good word, buddy? Yes, you are in my programs, and I love you for it. Appreciate that. Appreciate you. There, Randy. There is no such thing as a measly run, ever. There just isn't. Steve Thompson. Steve Thompson. My wife, we already got the race. We're running. I think it's like May Memorial Weekend 2022. So we'll be looking for your hospitality. <laughs> uh, Stephen Green, thanks for focus on number two. Day. You bet. Sokoloff114, hey to you, D, what's up, Andy? If you let your firm, oh, Steve Thompson, if you left your firm several months ago, what is your feeling about leaving it as a current LinkedIn versus putting the actual month you left? Okay, Steve, couple couple things. I, so let's, let's separate this because it's a great, great question he's asking here, folks, right? Because we're all like, well, do I change my profile? How's it going to be interpreted and whatever? The one thing, a couple, couple things here. Number one, so let's just, the issue itself of should I change my LinkedIn profile or not? You don't know if you reach out to a recruiter or a recruiter reach out, reaches out to you, whether that recruiter thinks the fact that you are available is better because they want you to start right away. Where I might tell you, yeah, it's probably better that you're employed and look desirable, right? And you're a great catch. But you could be a great catch and happen to be unemployed. We know this. And so you actually don't know which one works to your benefit. I could sit here all day long and you can listen to any career coach you want to say, well, you know, it's better if you're employed. Well, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it's not. So so just, just remember that. You don't know. So... If I left a company and now it's October and say I left in August, I probably wouldn't change my LinkedIn profile. I would have in the recruiter section, you know, am open to new opportunities, welcome any inquiries related to this and that. Put your notes to the recruiter. If, if you know, if things go on and it's another couple months and you decide, well, I'd like to change my LinkedIn profile and just let them know that I'm, I'm not working there anymore. That's okay too. I would not put the open to work circle around my face. You're entirely too handsome. And I wouldn't put the stamp, the hashtags open to work, looking for new opportunities or any of that stuff. I just wouldn't do that. So I, I you know, that's the way I would approach it. I don't think it's a big deal, uh, you know, honestly, either way. I don't think it's something you should agonize. Remember, as you go through your activities, certain activities are going to have far more ROI than others. And whether my LinkedIn profile says I'm, I'm here or I'm not, 
the diligence in you sending out the boss hunting letters, reaching out and networking with the right people, doing the job search challenge, that's where the results are going to come in. And I don't, I don't know that it matters all that much. Negligible. But it's a, it's a good question because I know a lot of people have the question. All right. Great to see you, Deb. Hey, Andy, LTNS, loving the new job. Awesome. Huge success accepting their this offer. Grateful for the insight today. Deb Chapman, I always love having you around. Uh, just a favorite boot camper of mine. So, so great. Steve, thanks. I'm guessing you can... <laughs> oh, no, I did not come in first. Oh, my God. It was a lot of energy, though. I was so relaxed. I was so relaxed before we took off. Medina, how are you? And then is it Lee, Andy, an urgent question? I have a new offer and need to... Oh, let's get this right up here. Come on, this sounds like a good one. Andy, urgent question. I have a new offer, need two references. My previous company is quite ticked off when, I, when I'm leaving. What can I do to ask them to give me a reference? Thank you so much. Uh, well, number one... Number one, I have a video on everything you could possibly want to know about reference checking. What references to provide, when to provide them, what to do, what not to do. I've covered this scenario that you've asked me about. I would highly recommend watching that for any of you that are job searching, no matter where you are in the process. If you haven't started your search and you're kind of getting warmed up, Go watch that dang thing because you're going to be you're going to be providing references on applications and all that good stuff. Sometimes uh, you don't even put them on the application, but the recruiter might ask you for them up front. Just just check that video out. Now, what I would say is honestly, if they, now now more often than not, the hiring company. If you are currently leaving your organization, meaning you are in the process, meaning I I I've, I've got the offer and I'm going to resign. What I would say to the new company is I do not want to provide a reference from my current company because they don't know that I'm leaving. That's the first thing. I would just say that. And then the employer is going to say, okay, can you give me somebody else? Can you give me maybe somebody you worked with or a senior person that you work with that maybe no longer at the company? Depending on how long you've been at the company, you might have somebody like that. Otherwise, go to a different company that you worked at. Get somebody from those organizations. This is appropriate. It's common and it's expected. Now, if you've already let them know that you've left your current company and they say, can we and they ask, can we get a reference from your current company? Just say to them that, um, well, I was, they were not happy that I left. They might not be the most um, viable or accurate reference providers. I would prefer to give you other people. Would that be okay? And I would just say that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's how I would handle it, but I would definitely go and watch that video on the references. I really would. It's, it's, it'll, it'll really help you. I hope the audio is working, Sue, because I was talking a long time. <laughs> All right, what do we got here? Uh, um, uh, um, um, oh, I am amazing MMA in your boot camp and learning so much. Thank you for teaching us how to train our minds as well as the actual job hunting skills. Maud, oh, Maud. Oh, my paisano friend. How are you? Great. That's great to hear you. I know you're a newer boot camper, so I'm glad you're enjoying it. I hope to see you next Thursday. Martin uh, uh, applied for several jobs, then made changes to the resume. Have to engage those companies that I've already applied to get them to see my new resume without discarding it as they may think it's the same. Okay, this is a good one here. So applied for the jobs, then changed the resume, how to engage those companies. So what I would do is if you've applied... I would try to target bosses, teammates, recruiters, HR people, other people, and get your new resume in front of them. That's my preferred route. If, you, if you've done that and they haven't responded and you've, you've kind of worked your way through the organization, take your new resume, reapply like you never applied before. Here's what happens. Old resume. 
didn't get seen, filtered out by the applicant tracking system, never made it into the recruiter's inbox, or wasn't high enough on the list for the recruiter to step through. Okay, New resume. Hopefully it's Andy style. You went through all the stuff. That gets noticed, or at least you got a better chance. And then they see that. Doesn't matter. I, I'm in the... I, hey, Martin. My dang job search is fluid, right? My life is fluid. I'm constantly improving myself. I'm constantly updating my resume. I'm tr constantly getting better. I applied last week, and since that time, I live in a whole new world, and this is what my resume looks like now. I'm serious. Recruiters know this. They know you're going you're gonna to change it. Now, let me add something here. Let's say, sake of argument, that you put the old resume in, and by the grace of God, you got, a, you got an interview, right? You had the goods, you made it through the applicant tracking system, and you got the interview, but you got a souped up resume now. This happens a lot, okay? Should I send the new resume, or should I bring the new resume in with me? If that's the case, I know you didn't ask me about this, but this is really, it's kind of along the same lines. If that's the case, you, you contact the recruiter if you've not gone into the interview yet, and you say, by the way, I've been continuing to update my resume. I have a new version that is, is a more current and a better version than the one I sent you. Would you be interested in that version? Or you can email the recruiter, attach the new version, and say, I wanted to just give this to you. I leave it, you know, your discretion if you want if you've already circulated it with to the interviewers, that's okay, but I just wanted you to have it. Okay. Now you get in the interview. When you're in the interview, you have to be careful. If I've already printed out your resume and I've made notes on it, which is what I should have done as a good interviewer, right? If I've already done that, what you don't want to do is slide me a new one. But what I would say is Oh, I see you've got my resume. I'm so nice that you've made some notes on it. I actually have a new version. I'm happy to give that to you if you want to. I just don't want to confuse you. But if you're interested, I have another version. If they say, no, don't worry about it, fine. If they say, yeah, give it to me, that's fine. What you don't want to do is you don't want to confuse them. Because if I know that if I've notated the things that I want to ask you about, I don't want to, I don't want to be looking for them and you moved them around and now you got a highlight section that you didn't have before or something like that. You just want to be careful. You want to give them the opportunity. Let's just make sure. All right. That's a, that's a great, that's a great question. Namritha, I have my eyes on a company and role I want to join after two to three years. What can I do on LinkedIn to maximize my chances of getting in in the interim? Okay, now, couple couple things here. So, if I read this correctly, you're saying that you don't want to you don't want to join. If I'm reading this, I have my eyes on a company I want to join after two to three years. Oh wait, I. Oh, wait, maybe you're saying it's been two to three years you've been monitoring them. What can I do on LinkedIn to maximize my chances of getting in, in the interim? Okay, no, wait. So I'm assuming what you mean is you don't want to get in there for a couple years. I'm not sure why you want to wait that long. Uh, but if I'm reading this correctly and you want more visibility, I would start building connections on LinkedIn with people that, who are working at that organization. And I would also... Uh, start, I would email everybody. I would email recruiters and say, hey, I'm reaching out. You know what? I'm not currently looking, but I'm fond of your organization. I'd love to open up a relationship with you if you're interested in networking or my, you know, talking to me about you know, potential candidates that you might be looking for. If I'd be happy to refer you. Just go give them some. Team members, hey, uh, I've been following your organization for a long time. I'd wonder if you'd be sharing, I wonder if you would share with me how you like working there. You know, something like that. Start building relationships uh, with, with these people. If you want to go after bosses, maybe you do a different style of message. Hey, I've always been fond of your organization. I noticed you work there in an area that is, is along my career path. I'd love to open up a relationship with you 
and uh, you know, see if we could connect on and then give them something specific to talk about. You know, something like that. But I would be, there's nothing wrong with networking. I have, a, I have multiple networking videos on my YouTube channel. I have business networking, which is general maintenance of your ongoing business relationships and keeping a healthy network. I have how to craft networking messages. That's the mechanics of what to say, the seven pieces that need to go into a networking message to elicit a response. Check those out. I think you'll I think you'll get a lot of value out of those. Mm. Hey folks, I always forget to say this. So we're an hour in. If you're loving this, click the little th- click the what was click the, the 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 like button on YouTube. Share this with people. A lot of people need this. Everybody needs to work on their thoughts. Help me out. Circulate the goodness. Make sure you're subbed to the channel. Martin, man, Martin, you are an efficient enterer of questions. When searching for jobs on a company's career site, I found three or four that I aligned with. Is it okay to submit my resume and so on? Check my video on, is it okay to apply to multiple jobs at the same company? Maria, is there a contact of recruiter in the job description to call them if I have any questions. Should I call them even if I don't have any at the moment? Is it good to think of any possible question? All right, Maria, if there is a contact on the job description and it's a recruiter or a hiring official, I would send them my email. I would send them my application directly. And I wouldn't ask them any questions. I would go at them with a cover letter that's appropriate for whoever it is that's on the description. Sometimes they put the boss. Sometimes they put the recruiter. Sometimes they put the HR person responsible. And no, I don't think it's necessary for you to ask questions unless they engage with you and say, hey, this is great, Maria. I see your background. Would love, And what they're likely going to say is, I'd love to talk to you. So, so that's, those are my thoughts on, on that. Erwin, what's a good word? Maria, is it better to find the hiring person on LinkedIn and to send them a message with the CV or to apply via ATS? It is always better to go direct to the hirer. It is the most effective way to get your next job for so many reasons. But that that's that's the answer for you. Ah, Deborah must be commenting on what I was talking about during the session. I, Andy, I could not agree more. I took a career change, and my perspective is everything. There is so much I am learning every day. I love to hear. Man, I'm so, I never get tired of listening to how well you're doing. I really will not because I, I remember when we first started getting engaged and and the 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 you know kind of the the where you were at that time, and it just it the transformation has been so great and so noticeable and i'm just i'm just so i am so happy for you i i really am laura cow andy how was the race please don't skip over this question okay that's funny the race was awesome it 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 is hard to describe and you you cannot possibly appreciate what transpired it rained for four days the the to give you an idea of doing this in I can't believe they actually held the event and there were over 200 cars that were stuck in the mud in the event that had to get towed out that's how bad the weather was and I mean I was changing in a mud pit I I I I I got off my bike after three plus hours of torrential downpour. My socks and shoes were muddy and soaked. I sat in a mud pit. I took my dirty socks off. I reached into my bag, into my my transition bag for what I thought was a waterproof bag. I took the socks out that I thought would be clean and dry. They were totally soaked. I wrung them out. I put them on my feet. I put my clean white new running shoes on. And I had nowhere to go but into a puddle. So bang, both feet went into a puddle and I ran 13.1 miles on silken wet feet and 10 of those were in the rain. I loved every minute of this. I really did. I mean, like, you, I couldn't make this stuff up. You know, I think one in four people didn't finish the race. It was, it was, it was like that. So it's a story that will never go away. It's an, an experience I would not trade for the world. And yes, I would like to do it on a sunny day. But, uh, but man, it was... It was, it was really something. It really was. 
Everything was in the ring. Raul, you're welcome. Oh, some of you guys were asking me this. Um, you know, Iron Man has a tracker. So like a lot of people could follow me uh, through the race. They could see exactly where I was, how fast I was swimming or biking or running or whatever. And, uh, you know, my, my wife said to me, she's like, you know, I got a little worried. You were in the, the transition area, the first one, where you come out of, out of the lake and get on the bike for a really long time. I said, well, first off, we, I, had to, I had to walk a, a quarter mile on concrete and rocks to get to the transition area that was full of mud. I had to get my wetsuit off. I had to get my biking gear out, which was like everything was muddy and it was just, I mean, it was, it was, it was so much fun. I know it's really, it sounds ridiculous, but, but yeah, it was, you could have followed me anywhere during the race and it was really, um, it was really, really a lot of fun. Although I did glance at the, 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 the numbers aren't accurate on the, on the Ironman site. They're actually, I had to look through some of it. Um, on, there's a different site that actually had more accurate numbers, I think, but I haven't looked in, in the, all the details. But it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, it's hard to describe. It's not about the numbers because you could always finish faster and you can always go slower. And the elements have a lot to do with that. Grave 79, worked outside my JD for three years to work toward a promotion, proven value, proven, proven benefit value, JD got rewritten instead. Salary to hourly feels like a demotion. Where to go from here? I feel broken. Okay. Best piece of advice I can give you is I would look for all the value in what you did. I would, I would use my career achievements journal to reflect on everything that you did. I would arm myself with, number one, the thinking time the reflection, the capturing of the data, the values, and so on. And then I would go to whoever I needed to, my boss, my management team, or whatever, and I would say I'd love to you know, have, a, have an on-the-fly review and really kind of take a look at where I've been for the last three years and how we, we move forward to get me directed on a path that I would really like or that I would I want to work toward and I want to add the most value for the company but I also want to make sure I was a, sol a great soldier for 3 years I want to make sure I'm getting in, in on the right on the right path. I would do that. I would. By the way, uh, because it's on point. I mentioned that on October 15th I have a leadership coaching session. That leadership coaching session is actually on conducting performance reviews. It's everything that you, you needed to be doing from the moment your period started, meaning it could be the first day on a new job, it could be the first day of the year, it could be the first day of the, of the review period or whatever it is. And everything you need to do from the time you start up until preparing for it, the information you need to collect, what you need to do with it, how you conduct the, the session, how you recap the session, and everything to make sure that that this is not an afterthought discussion, that you are completely armed. So if you're interested in that, you can try the program out for a month or you can, you know, it's uh, $49 a month or if you're in my boot camp already, we give our boot campers a little uh, a discount on the monthly rate or it's uh, $297 a year, which turns out to be about $24 a month or you can join on a lifetime subscription. P-Bell, thank you for that. I love swimming. I really do. Thank you. D City, could you give an example of this approach as it relates to navigating the boot camp? Feeling stuck? Yes. I love this. Okay, D City, I wish I knew who you were. So you asked about navigating the boot camp, and I'm gonna cover that quickly, but what I'm really thinking you mean is navigating the job search. Because when you go, okay, so if I, if I signed up for my job search boot camp, my, my big coaching program for job searching, I would, day one, go through all the welcome videos and do vid module number one. That's success. Did I go through it? Yes. Did I get my notes? Did I get the downloads? Do I know where everything is? 
did I capture in my, so the way I go through a training program is I, oh, my journal's not here, but uh, I have a journal that's allocated to that. I'd have a job search bootcamp journal, just a like a A5 booklet. I use the Lectrum 1917s and I would make the notes and Andy said that at two minutes and 20 seconds, I know I'm gonna have to come back to that and keep going and soak it all in because what happens? You're not gonna retain it all, but what are you gonna do? Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I know that reinforced. I won't forget that, right? You know that. Okay, wait, hang on, that's different. Hang on, now I'm understanding and I'm diagnosing what I was doing incorrectly. I'm gonna make a note on that, right? That's something new. Then the next day, I'd go through the next module and the next module and the next module and so on, five modules. I'd go through them and that would be my first week. I wouldn't do any job searching. I would go through my program. I would, because to have visibility to what that house looks like before you start building the rooms is really important because the moment you send your resume somewhere, instantaneously something can come back and you need to know then what to do. You don't know what to do until you've gone through the third module. The second module you did resume, the third module tells you what to do, kind of thing. So, so that's going through the process and success is about going through and understanding what's happening. Then I would say, okay, now I'm gonna do a self-diagnosis. What wasn't I doing correctly, so on and so forth. Now what success look like? I need to get my resume in order. I need to get my covers in order. I need, right, like boom, boom, boom. Those, you do all that in the first week or first week or two. Then I would look at the job search challenge. You have a different version than the rest of the world. You have a six video breakdown of everything that you need to do to reach out to this world, bring yourself to market, and then my success metrics would be, did I identify my three companies a day? Did I identify the three people a day? Did I, did I actually send the thoughtful email? Check, check, check. Okay, great. What's the intent? Get an interview. Did I get an interview? Nope, that's okay. Right? Let me give you a different example. We, so as at Mile Walk, the executive search firm, as we operated that for years, and I'd have recruiters, and I would say to them, there's 22 work days in a month, okay? You're gonna fail 20 of those 22 days. Meaning, you are not gonna place a candidate for 20 days of the 22 or 23. But on those two days, you're gonna get a big, big paycheck, okay? Now, if every single day at five o'clock or six o'clock when you knock off, you're worried because you didn't make a sale, that's not the right thing. You're not focusing on the right stuff. Um, are you focusing on did I, how many candidates did I find? How many candidates did I interview? How many candidates did I actually send to our clients? Because I could tell them that for every two you send, actually less, one's gonna take a job. So if you sent two, that's great. The next day if you send two, you're gonna, you're gonna get two placements kind of thing. So you gotta be consistent. So their success metrics weren't sales. There's all I needed to do to know if they were gonna be successful was did, you, did we send out X number of people because we don't just send them out to send them out. There's strict protocols that are required to do that. It's the same thing for a job search. Each day, you're sending out your messages. You won't get an interview every day, but you're gonna get an interview every third day if you, if you stay with it. And so I would have success metrics of what I would watch. Now, D-City in the bootcamp, in module three, and in the job search, the supplemental product, I go into that. That's what I'm talking about. So when, when you're focusing on these things, the reason you all, forget the boot camp for a second. Well, don't ever forget my boot camp, but you know what I mean. If you're job searching and you're all upset, all I have to do is look back at your traction and then say, well, have you been sending messages? Oh, you've been applying in the applicant tracking system? Oh my goodness, not only are you not looking at the right things, but you're doing it the wrong way and your failure rate's gonna be off the charts, in which case you're gonna be miserable. That's why you get zero credit if you put your resume into an applicant tracking system because you're it's like uphill into the wind and you know with the brakes on kind of thing. Instead of, hey, I know that if you are in the boot camp and you are using these templates and you are sending three messages a day, you should have two interviews a week kind of thing, 
right? So we know that. Now, does that mean you're going to get two the first week? No. You might have to go through two weeks, then all of a sudden you get one or two, and then you have lag time too, right? People get back to you. We had, I had a couple people uh, in VIPs of mine that are in the boot camp, that are in the VIP package. They set up a coaching session with me, which is part of the package that they enrolled in. They were frantic because they were sending out their messages and they weren't getting results. And then I emailed them and I, I both two of them, same time, almost on the same schedule. I said, um, hang on, it's, uh, let me see, it's the middle of August and you're sending out these messages. You ain't, you ain't gonna get a lot of traffic back. So, oh, no problem, we'll have your session and let's have the session week after next or whatever. You keep doing what you're doing. And then by then, let me know a couple days in advance if you're gonna wanna change the agenda. Okay, this is me to them knowing and they're miserable, right? Because they don't, they're not getting traction. And I already know it's the middle of August. They just started. Everybody's out on vacation. And anybody who's back on vacation is catching up on their inbox. Sure enough, I get to the week. They're like, I got four interviews. It's like, I want to interview prep. It's okay, no problem. Right? You have to stick with it. You don't know everything that's going on. And, and by the way, just because that happened to be a high travel vacation month, then September, kids go back to school and so on. But at any moment in time, the people you're reaching out to may have different priorities, maybe going through their own projects, their own issues, their own whatever. So that's why you want to be consistent and continually send that out. And that's the, what's another way to set, say this? Success metrics in a job search should only be set around what? Wait, somebody tell me what the word is I'm going to say and I will give you a free something you will love. What is the only thing, it's one word, what is the only thing you should set a success metric around? Give me the word. What's the word I'm looking for? So you're going to set a success metric in your job search. What are you setting it around in anything in your life? What should success metrics only be set around? Give me, I'm going to watch this. We got any, any, anybody want to take a chance? Give me the one word. What's the one word? You could use three words if you want. Where do you set metrics? No takers. I know I'm on a delay, so I'm going to sip my coffee. I got nothing coming in. No. Nope. Nope. You can be. There you go. Denisha. Ding, 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 ding. Only set it around stuff. I could not control the weather. It took me an extra 20 minutes to bike those 56 miles because my face was bruised. I had no clothing on. I had goosebumps all over, right? You only set it around stuff you can control. I can find the company. I can research. I could craft that letter. Andy gave me the template. I could send it out. No one can stop me. Success, success, success. Is that Denisha M? Is that Denisha M? If that's Denisha, I think, Denisha, email support. Email support at mawat.com. We'll give you something big, whatever. We'll figure it out. Uh, because if you're my boot camper, uh, maybe we, I think you're in leadership program too. I'll figure something out to give you. But you only set it around stuff you can control. Why? You will never fail. Never. It's impossible if that's how you look at it. I couldn't deter. I can influence the number of people that buy a product, but I can't make you buy the product. I can't control that. Right? So that's what you set. Ask yourself, can I control this success metric? The intent was to finish that swim. I couldn't control those waves, man. <laughs> right? But I showed up. I controlled what I control. I did my best and I was smart about it. I couldn't control the weather. I can't control whether that person responds to me. I can't control whether they're busy. I can look and analyze the data. I could look to see what, right? What I could maybe do better, right? What you can control. Only what you can control. Yes, it's Tanisha M. All right, Tanisha. You you email us and we'll we'll get you we'll get you something. I love that. All right, wait, where 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 was I? <laughs> Hang on. Now I got I think I lost where I was. Hold on. Oh god. All right. There we go. 
Laura Cobb, yay, yay. What a reframe. Stop it. <laughs> Mustafa, hey to you. Glad you got the book. Folks, if you don't have that book right there, grab it while it's still seven bucks for materials and handling and all the free stuff. Yeah, there was a picture of the wetsuit. Yeah, boot camber in. Mine's okay. Where was the question? Thank you guys hitting the thumbs up. I had my eye on a company. I think I got that. Joe Lazeski! What's the good word, buddy? Great to see you. Do you have any idea? Andrew, do you have any idea? D A M T, damped. Uh, do you have any idea how much should I expect or negotiate for a relocation package moving to Mexico in a fan company? It's there's nothing to expect, meaning, yes, there should be some kind of relocation package. Every company's different. Some give you a flat stipend. Some say send us the bill. Some have you worked through a third-party organization that will do everything for you, including buying your home, meaning your current home or whatever. So I don't have a number, but it is negotiable, and make sure that you consider that and you have a handle on what those expenses would be should you have to do it on your own. That's, that's really important. All right, let's keep rolling. Wait, all right, I got a few more minutes here. I want to answer a couple more questions, but just recapping real quick. Thir Wednesday next week, the 13th, special show on job search congruence. Thursday, the 14th, if you want to get in the job search boot camp, the job search coaching program, as I call it, that's a private group session, uh, $100 off till Thursday and if you are in if you are a boot camper by Thursday you can come to the Friday show with my leadership coaching program that's a separate uh, membership it's actually a, a monthly membership you can cancel anytime or yearly or lifetime and you don't want to cancel uh, that's on performance reviews then the following Wednesday live office hours is about resume writing actually it's more about the psychology of the resume what how recruiters look at it how people look at it what they're expecting to find and so on and then the following week Thursday, I have live office hours, and Friday, that's the 28th, October 29th, we have a special resume writing Q&A for members of my resume writing workshop, and all the boot campers also have that program, so so those two universes will, will, will be joining me on the 29th, so I hope that is clear. And make sure, uh, there's a, there, our public calendar, we have a Gmail calendar with all these live events in it, freebies, and premiums, and you can see and sync, and there, there's no obligation, no sign up. You just sync it to your to your calendar of choice, whether it's iCal or Outlook or Gmail or whatever, and then you'll know where I am. All right, Mustafa. Uh, hey, Andrew, what do I do when a recruiter does not join a scheduled interview and ignores your, your uh, LinkedIn DMs? Okay, those are two separate things to me. If they're ignoring your DMs, you stop and you move on to something else. If a recruiter sets a scheduled interview and does not show up, I don't know if that was an executive recruiter or a corporate recruiter, but regardless, I would reach back to them and say, hey, I wanted to reach back to you. I was at the session at whatever time, and uh, I'm still interested in connecting. Can you please let me know? And then what I would expect, here we go with expectations again, uh, when you reconnect, if they say, if they, if they reply to you, what I would hope they would say is, Mustafa, I am so sorry. My dog got sick. I had to rush to the hospital. Oh, my God. I got a flat tire. I'm so sorry. Whatever. Like, they actually, in my opinion, somebody owes you an explanation at that point. Okay? Now, if, 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 if they say, yes, let's reschedule 3 o'clock tomorrow at that session, if they have not emailed you their explanation, they should fall all over themselves and make sure that they're explaining to you and apologizing why they missed it. That to me is, is a courtesy, right? You set the time aside on your calendar. I think they owe that to you. And here again, now we can't make them apologize, but if somebody didn't apologize to me about blowing me off for something that we had scheduled, I wouldn't work with you. I would, no, I don't need your whatever that badly, right? That's how I think about that. Deborah Chapman, you, oh goodness, you are genuinely the most inspiring human I've ever met. You're going to make me blush and probably cry. Thank you for sharing how you handled and managed your perspective. I'm so sorry that the day was not all you had hoped. It was all I had hoped. It was all I had hoped, Deborah, and thank you for that. 
and it was all I had hoped for and more. I wish the sun was shining. It wasn't. But, you know, I knew in the morning, I think I put that picture on my Instagram where I, it was me in my hoodie and I'm walking with my big bag and I'm just getting poured on and it's pitch black and my wife, you know, she dropped me off somewhere. I had to walk a mile to get to the transition area and that's just the way it rolls and I'll never forget that. That was just part of that story and that's why I'm already looking for my next ones to do because I want to see what I can do in the sunshine. So it's, um, it's all good. It really, it really is. I, uh, you know, I, I, I I'm gonna, I, we need to, you know, I, I, I need to save that. I, I, I need, I need to save that for my, for my scrapbook. Believe me, you guys don't know this, but I have scrapbooks of emails and all kinds of stuff that you guys say in the live shows and email me and put, put on the, you know, uh, public sites and things like that, because I reach for that for inspiration because, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly feeding myself the, the you know, the, it, I don't want to say positive self-talk because it's not that, it's not that trite. I mean, it really is, is focusing on how you think, but, um, you know, I go through a lot of rough stuff too. And so, you know, your message is like this. Um, if my energy, it rarely wanes, but if it ever does, I reach for that and I look at that and say, no, they need you. And I, I've, I've talked to you probably on a number of occasions about how the most successful people in this world, whatever they do has a necessity component to it. It is necessary that I show up at 11 o'clock on Thursday with my best and be on my game because they need me. That's necessary. It is important for me to be there for my wife when, when she wants to talk about whatever. You know what I mean? Like It is necessary. And with all of you, You've got to find that necessity in your life, in, in multiple aspects of your life, especially in your work and in your primary relationships. It's got to be there. It really does. It will keep you going. But your nice remarks like that really keep me going too. George, you're welcome. Savannah, hey to you. Mashid, let's see if we can get you in here. Approached by a company, worked with manager. Uh, I'm wondering if you mean in your current position, you worked at the manager. Final interview with the CFO. It's a better position, significantly higher pay. Growth app. I love this. Old company, recent investment by PE, new biz dev team. Any advice? So, number one, I know you are officially well trained already on the Andy interviewing techniques, but I would make sure, I would make sure that you, the one, let me give you a you know, because there's a lot to unpack there. But the one thing I would be, I would, the piece of advice I would give you that I want, I want you to be really careful about. And I'm assuming you're in Canada still. Everything's good with you and your husband. This is just another job. You're staying put. You're not moving back to to your old country and all that good stuff. When I go in there, and and because you talked about a recent investment in PE money, and any of you, so not just Mashid, but any of you that are going into an organization that is has gotten PE money or VC money and whether it's recent or it's it was given a year or two ago or whatever it is depending on the series level it is you want to make sure that you understand what is expected in that organization from a production standpoint because whoever gives a company money wants a return and if they're not getting the return then they start forcing themselves and your hand about how you're going to operate. It's not always for the better and it, it can foster a very tricky culture and an environment where there's a lot of turnover. Uh, I had a, um, I'll, sp I'll speak from a, a specific example. We, I was an angel investor in a company and it was like five guys in a garage, put the money in and we started building this thing. And, and Milewalk, my executive search firm, was actually recruiting for this organization. We started to hire people, we started to grow. The CEO was very savvy, super guy, very sharp. And the president, very sharp as well, and started to grow. And then three years, and now the environment, the culture was awesome. Everybody felt like an owner. Now you got a bunch of people working in this technology consultancy and we get an infusion of uh, venture capital money. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the culture changes because there are demands uh, unreasonable, in, quite frankly, that sales needs to go up this way 
And right, well, that when you start doing things like that, you start taking projects you shouldn't be on. You start, it's all kinds of stuff that goes wrong, that then trickles down to the to the individuals. Now, if so the reason I say this is, you might be machine. You might be in a position where you'll only notice that the behaviors in the company have changed. Now, you might not know the difference because it might already have changed, but usually there's a lag. Okay, it usually takes a little time. Or you might be in a position that is hugely risky because you are in a position required to generate revenue or do certain things that you are not doing quickly enough. So then you want to start getting into what's the environment like? Has it changed since you've got that infusion? Has the management structure changed? What has Have the expectations changed? How patient are they going to be with the results they set? you got to go through all these layers of questions to make sure that you understand what's expected, where am I, where am I position-wise, what's expected of me, is that realistic? So that whole, what does success look like? You have to look and make sure that they're not being unreasonable. So after this VC company, this story I'm telling you, t t puts the money in, well, all of a sudden, our senior vice president of sales, they let him go in like five months because it, you know, that wasn't moving fast enough. Then they recklessly hire another person. I say to the CEO, that guy's not going to be here in 12 months. It's not the right, not, doesn't have the right blood. Sure enough, 11 months later, bang, he's out, right? And so you've got this crazy revolving door because they're impatient. So you're looking for their patience level, their commitment level, what resources they're going to provide, what their expectations are, not just how much, how fast, but also what does the mixture of the clients look like? What, it, you know, all this stuff that goes into understanding what is probably a changing environment. So that, So more than just how do you sell yourself, I'm actually not worried about that with you. I'm more concerned with you getting at this information because it's a, you know, recent investment by a private equity organization. All right. I hope that serves you and I'm, I wish you a lot of luck and you let us know if you need anything because uh, you, you, you know where to find me. I hope that helps. Randy Cole. Found an opportunity at a great company in the type of role I want to move into. Don't have any contacts in the company on LinkedIn. Uh, would it be a good idea to reach out to the senior recruiter listed in LinkedIn in the LinkedIn site or keep hunting for an internal member to connect with? Randy, I would go and see if I could find a boss. I would take a shot. I would give that a week. If you don't, if the person doesn't get back to you, I would try to contact the recruiter. I would do it in that sequence. All right, folks, I gotta get rolling. Uh, so Lots going on. Uh, I think we probably, if you opened your email this morning, probably have that calendar that I mentioned. I hope I, I think I put it in there in that email this morning. Uh, sync up with our calendar of events. If you're enjoying this, click the thumbs up button, share it as well as if you are, if I didn't get to your question, feel free to ask me in the comments below the video. In, in a few seconds, this is going to be recorded and live on on YouTube forever. Otherwise, everybody, have a have a great weekend. I'll see you Tuesday, or maybe Monday in your inbox with the calendar, Tuesday with the digest in your inbox, Wednesday at the live show, Thursday, Friday at the live show. Hopefully you can make it all. And thank you all for the good wishes and the support on the Ironman was just, just a dream. And uh, I'm on to the next one. All right, we'll see you.